Good evening and welcome back to the X-Ring. We have a really exciting episode for you tonight. We have a couple guests on. We have Matt P here and we also have Kenneth I with Desert Precision Gunworks. And tonight's topic is going to be a great topic. It's going to be how to get into a team match or a team sniper match or precision match. I'm not going to do a lot of the talking. I'm finding a little bit of a head cold, so I felt sound a little nasally right now. But uh, I think it'll be a great topic. And if we get uh, if we get Kenny on here, let me bring him into the mix. What's up, Kenny? Hello, and uh, yeah, I do apologize. Also, we do we have came down with a cold from that cobalt kinetic shot, so we are a little nasally. Yeah, I think that was uh, from being shooting out in the desert out in Utah. There was just so much dust flying around. Uh, pretty much everyone that was uh, shooting that match had some type of uh, head congestion or something from that. So that's what we're fighting right now. So both of you guys have participated in a team match with me. Um, so what I want to do is kind of give everybody thoughts on it. What We want to talk about the mental preparation. We want to talk about the equipment. And then also the different types of team matches. Uh, what's up, Josh? I saw you out there, Pursuit of Accuracy, and thanks for everybody Josh? else joining in tonight. So what are some big takeaways for you, Matt? Let me go ahead and break away from Kenny for just a minute. I'll let you have it. What do you want to talk about, gear or what I've learned? What you've learned. Whew. Be per the biggest thing for me was um, finding targets and communication. Yeah. Um, that was my biggest takeaway. I've watched his videos, Kenny's, Ray's, you know, Rick's, everyone's, and um, you're really juggling probably five or six things at one time. Yep. Um, yeah, communication was huge. That was the biggest takeaway I got out of the match. Naturally, I think I was pretty decent with finding targets, except for one stage. That was a disaster. Um, but we I still recovered. Yeah, we recovered, but if we... <laughs> Definitely uh, communication is what I learned. All right. We'll get Kenny's thoughts here in just a minute. For those of you that might be new to the channel, um, you know, I got a big boost from the firearms blog when uh, he did a post when we did the Surefire event. Uh, just a little bit about my background on shooting some of these team events. Um, in 2014, I won the Gastonia Sniper Comp. I was shooting with, at the time, it was my sniper partner. His name was Greg. And we made an unbelievable team. Uh, the communication was there, but he shot for a different agency than I did. And there were some big issues with his agency not pairing up with somebody from his own department. Uh, but we were pretty much an unstoppable team. And in that Gastonia sniper comp, you know, you're competing against Canadian Special Forces, uh, third group, fifth group, Delta, a uh, lot of... Um, scout sniper teams and yeah coast guard was there so we won that in 2014 and then greg and i did the guilford county sniper comp in 2015. Uh, we took first overall team i took first uh first place overall and then that's kind of when greg and i had to quit shooting together because they wouldn't allow it they would not give him time off to be able to shoot the events which kind of sucks because it was a really good dynamic uh, one other thing that i did take note of is he was a left-handed shooter i was a right-handed shooter so we always put Greg on my left. I was on the right and we could get really, really close together because he's working mm -hmm. his action with the other hand. I'm working with my right. I uh, don't know if that made any difference, but the communication was just there and we did a lot of training together. In 2018, uh, I won the Snipers Unknown. I was shooting with Tony and we won that overall. And then I took Tony to the Burris Extreme out in Douglas, Wyoming. And that was a completely different style of event. That one had a big physical aspect to it. Uh, we took 10th in that one, which wasn't that great, but it was the first time getting him into something like that that had a lot of physical to it, which Kenny competed in that with me as well. So we'll get his thoughts on that here in just a minute. 2019, uh, I took Bryson, who you guys might have seen from um, shooting out west in Utah at this PCSL event. We actually took third place in Trooper Division, We'll talk about different divisions and all that. That was the Bushnell Elite, which is now called the Vortex Extreme. And then uh, here recently, the Snipers Unknown 2021, I took uh, third place uh, with Tony again. So that's where all this information is coming from. It's not, you know, just shooting off the cuff. It's stuff that's worked for us. And uh, what we've done is I brought all the gear and equipment. We'll show you that. We won't show you any rifles or firearms because we are live. So, um, and they don't allow it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to Kenny and we'll get to your questions here in just a minute. 
Oh, oh, Kenny's gone. I don't know what happened to Kenny. Kenny. Oh, Kenny's gone. So Kenny. we'll get to Kenny here in just a minute. I think he still has the link, so he'll be able to come back in. But uh, there he is. All right, so now we have Kenny in here. So, Kenny, you were able to shoot the Burris Extreme with me. Right. What, what were your thoughts on that? That's not really a sniper match. That's more of a light ruck style match. Yeah, that ruck style match really relied on team communication skills, rifle skill set, as well as um, pistol. So uh, that was a whole different experience coming from a precision rifle series background in the competitions that I've done that year. Um, that totally has challenged me in, in a different way um, as far as marksmanship. So. How about physically? You trained for that match. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, I kind of slacked off since then, I'll be honest. But, no, that match is a very um, physical match. It required agility. It required stamina. Um, it required your mental fitness as well. Um, so how that match ran was basically it was a one-hour time limit with a total of what, eight courses. Or was it eight courses? Six courses, something like that. But basically you had a total of these courses to do. If you bump the team in front of you, they basically, um, you know, they lose a lot of points. Vice versa, if you were to get bumped, you're pretty much – it's going to be damn near impossible to catch up. So the key fact to it was to keep going, make your hits, make all your points count, and keep hustling. So that competition dynamics was very fun, very fast-paced. And, of course, day one was uh, super challenging for us. Yeah, so Gagabytes has a really good question here. It says, is it necessary to carry some form, form of barrel bore protection – uh, to keep dust and sand out of the bore. Um, you know, in those competition settings, it really tests your gear. And, you know, as we know, if you guys have watched our channel, we we uh, we took our rifles to our pressure washer, actual car wash. That's how that's how much mud got into our gear. There was mud on everything, um, and it might be a good good thing to have. But honestly, on a competition dynamics that that team still safari that style match there was no time for you to clear out any of that debris um in between stages i mean maybe on the run you can but maybe an air can duster might be something to have something where you can spray down in there and get all the dust out but there is no time for you to wipe down your bolts or anything it's literally give it all all you got and whatever fails fails yeah that's the biggest thing i think people don't realize is how hard we push this equipment um, if it's going to fail, it will fail at one of these matches with all the moving and the shuffling around. And as you found out, you have to think on your feet at these matches. Very quickly. It's very, very quickly. So, uh, and guys, I do have structure to this. I actually put together um, some, some notes here. So what we'll talk about, regardless of whether you're shooting a team sniper match, which was like the Coleman's Creek that Matt and I just did last week, where you're shooting against a lot of military teams, that is completely different than what Kenny and I did out West. And that is more of a relaxed pace, um, except for the Burris. The Burris is, is not a relaxed pace. Uh, you just need to know what you're signing up for. Also, DMR matches, uh, designated marksman matches. That has a completely different dynamic. Your optics will probably be different. So we'll start with equipment. And uh, if any of you guys have any objections or anything like that or disagree, just, just go ahead and pipe on up. But as far as your equipment, as long as your rifle can hold one minute, I think you'll be good at pretty much any match. You do not need a half minute or quarter minute rifle. You don't have to shoot hand loads. You can shoot factory ammunition as long as you can reliably print one minute all the time at 100 yards. You do need a sling. Uh, my personal choice for a sling is a VTAC sling. Uh, what do you got in front? Um. Well, I was running the two-point sling. Uh, God, who made it? I think it was Patriot Arms or something. Uh, other than that, I had the uh, biathlon sling. So, yeah. Um, you know, but that was a running way. style match at the Burroughs, so we needed those tab gear biathlon slings. Yeah, the tab gear. No, I was. I think it was Patriot Arms was the one. Uh, it was um, from the, uh, Richard Hedges. He sent that over, and that one actually worked out pretty good. Gotcha. How about you, Matt? Uh, I ran one of your VTACs, and I think it's worth every penny. Um, having the pack, 
a rifle slung with a suppressor hanging off the end and your battle belt with pistol. You could easily manipulate it with, with one arm. It was one pull or another little pull to adjust it. And it was, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic sling. Yeah. So that's going to segue me into talking about these packs. So in the beginning, uh, we were looking and using Eberly stocks. We were using Warrens. And while they have their place, I think for these matches, it's too cumbersome. Uh, it's too much weight in the pack. Um, and like I said, while they do have their place, I think for most of these matches, keeping a smaller, lightweight pack and just running the rifle slung is going to be more beneficial. Would you agree? Yeah, it depends. And that goes into division, too, if you're doing trooper or – if you're just there for the day, going back to a hotel, or if you're camping overnight, that might that might adjust how big of a pack or you might be going with. True. True. So in a lot of these matches, I'm always talking about some of these ruck matches will have three divisions. You've got Lurper, which is the hardest division. You're going to carry all of your gear, all of your food, all of your sleeping um water and everything you cannot share anything with anyone that's lurper division and typically you're going to be on the course two or three days depending on the format of the match then you're going to have trooper division trooper division is what bryson and i did and you're going to do all the hiking we covered over 30 miles over the course of three days uh, but at the end of the day you're released to go to your hotel and you just have to be back in the morning then they have a mechanized division which means they put your butt in a trailer and they take you from stage to stage, which means you're going to wait a long time. Usually you still got to wait on the guys that are hiking to get there. So on some matches, you'll have three different divisions. Um, Mammoth used to run that way, but now what they've done is they've knocked out those other ones and there is only Lurper division. So you're going to do your camping and your shooting overnight and your food and everything else. So uh, extra magazines and holders. Yeah, you definitely want something on a battle belt as well as maybe a spare on your pack. Why would we do that in the pack? If I end up running the gun dry, instead of digging in the pack, Ray can strip a mag right off the pack for me, throw it at me, slide it to me, whatever, vice versa. I can get him a fresh magazine without having to reach inside or open anything up. So. Yeah, so that's exactly right. You got to remember a team match has a team element. You're not doing this alone. And you got to be careful because I think a lot of people that are into this, this type of shooting, long range shooting, I, I want to be very careful how I say this, but it's a lot of, a lot of alpha males, if you will. Um, they're used to taking control and you got to be careful when you do that in team dynamic because you will butt heads and you see it quite a bit. You see some big tempers going off, um, especially between some of the top teams because you know, one guy might say this is the best way. Another guy might think it's the best way. And remember, you're working as a team. So it's good to practice together and work on that communication and make sure that you understand each other. As far as a bipod, that is a given. You need a bipod. I don't care if you're using an Atlas or a Harris or a Skypod. Uh, you just have to have it. Now, versatility is everything. I'm still going to say the Skypod is a must have but you don't necessarily have to have it to win. It can just help you get into a position better. Uh, I do know for a fact that the last match that Matt and I put on, one of my positions were extremely downhill slope, and you were shooting this direction, okay? So this way. On that double sky, I was able to pull it all the way down, whereas everyone else were having to use their packs because you couldn't lay prone and use a conventional bipod. It just would not get the front of the rifle up high enough. So there are time and places for it. But with that being said, I usually carry two bipods. I carry a normal like an Atlas or a Thunder Beast. And I'll have a Skypod in case. But remember, you're not going to have time to switch it if it's a blind stage. You just got to kind of go with what you got. Kenny, anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, well, for the competitions that we did, it seemed like I'd say over 70% of the courses were tripod work. Um, you know, we were using a lot of your, your Anvil 30, and I think that is the best system to have to shoot off a tripod. There's a lot of place, uh, positions or positional shooting where you can't get over or you can't lay prone or kneeling or anything because you're going to have an obstacle way, be it that a tree limb, a rock, or even, a, you know, the next the next ridge. Um, they, they put those in place 
for you to think on your feet in order to um, you know make those shots. And majority of the time, it, they're going to be shooting off a tripod. So, you know, I think uh, practicing of shooting off a tripod is a huge benefit. Yeah, so guys, what he's talking about is this Anvil 30 ball head. Um, I actually did a review of this a couple years ago. Um, this is probably one of the best, most versatile ball heads there is because you have this thumb lever, you're not turning any turn screws, and then you have a quick release for your Arca. I'm not going to say an Arca is 100% absolute that you have to have it, but it will make your life a lot easier. Right. When you're switching from rifles to bipods or different optics that are on here. The Before I start talking too much about the really right stuff, I know that you guys have had a lot of experience with other tripods. McKinney with the two vets, you were looking at a two vets, you decided against it. Uh, what are some of the things that you look for in a tripod now that both of you have shot with one of these? Well, uh, when you're packing it around, honestly, the, your, the one that you have, I think was the best. Or now the situation I had, I was running the um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, two-day assault pack, and the tripod that I have was too long, where it was pretty much sticking up and the head, at head height was swinging around. So, you know, the the tripod being being a trifold, basically a three extension leg that holds up really nice and compact, was very beneficial for a last match. Um, obviously, deployment on the clock is key. That's how you save time. Uh, we do have ability to pre-stage, so obviously when you're in a pre-stage situation, you deploy everything. Um, you know, I, I've ran the Leo photos. The Leo photos seem to work, but honestly, I would not recommend that to be shooting off of uh, as a primary. Uh, the really right stuff, you just got to fork up the money. It is the best gear out there for that. Yeah, so that's a good point. Guys, this is the reason why I run the tfct 24 this is about really right stuff you'll see that it has the extensions where it, it's a really long tripod but if you're looking for something extremely tall uh, this isn't going to fit that bill you can shoot off of it perfectly but it packs up so small in a pack you don't even know you have it and we already have it ready to go i usually take binos and while it's in the pack okay so guys this is a sig the 3000, it doesn't matter. We'll talk about binos and stuff in a minute. But this is a really right stuff clamp. And it's an Arca Swiss clamp. It just goes onto one end of the bino. And they make them in polymer. They also make them in aluminum. Uh, but basically, I can just quickly attach to this because you will not get a good reading if you're trying to hold your, bi your uh, binos. Now, there were some military teams that had some $20,000 plus image stabilization binoculars at this match, and it's not going to make you win, okay? Um, having that, that equipment, while it's great, you know, most people are not going to be able to afford that. All you need are some laser range finding binos, and that is a must. You right. do not want to try to go out there with a set of handhelds and then try to find them with your binos, put your binos down, then go to your laser range finder. You need to be able to do both simultaneously. I wouldn't even attempt it. I wouldn't even attempt yeah. going unless you have a pair of those. Yeah, to so, be, to be honest. so someone actually asked the question. It was a great question. I'm trying not to skip anyone. I'm trying to answer all your questions. Uh, Outlaw Josie Wells says, best range-finding binos that have a mill reticle, ballistic program, and will link with the Kestrel. The Steiner make one. So, so Steiner does make one, and it does have a mill reticle in it, but you're only going to have half mill subtensions. One of the biggest things, and this is a huge takeaway that everybody really needs to keep in mind, even though these link to a Kestrel, it's too slow. Yep. Even though the Vortex Fury is linked to a Kestrel, it's too slow. For this stuff that we're doing with these matches, the only way to go is to use a data arm board and have all of your dopamine in here. So here are some examples of ones that we use. This is a Mayflower. This is actually the one that Matt ran at the match. And so, and these are things that we bought, guys. Uh, they didn't send them to us, but it's called a Mayflower. Um, and it's a good unit. It, uh, you can open it up, and so he's got his dope, and he's got my dope, as well as a pin holder. 
If you're going to run in the rain, make sure that your dope cards are laminated in tape because they will get wet and they'll start smudging. I run this large one. It's made by a company called Sun Tactical, I believe, and it's a triple. And these will run about $50 or $60. But what I've got on this is my dope front and rear, a marker. I have another insert that had Matt's dope here. And then you have these this elastic here that you can just put around the arm. Yeah, we, we ran ours both the same way. Our dopes were on the face. You rip it open and then vice versa. His dope was inside. Mine was inside of his. And that seemed to work out real well. Right. Yeah, I'm glad we're talking about that because I had a question. Folks are asking me if we use our cash roll during the, during the match. We don't have time. Um, Correct. We have, yeah, we, we have not once broke out the cash roll during that match. I think, what did we do? I, I checked the win one time. I spun it up once. Yes. And that was on the walk to the next stage. So, guys, while there are going to be differences, you're not going to have time to bring out your cash roll. This is not a PRS match where you're going to be looking at your targets. You're going to be in a blind stage holding area for most of your sniper matches or your team matches. So you have no idea where the targets are or layouts. So when they say go, so like the matches Kenny and I did, um, you have six minutes. That's like all the time in the world. Last weekend, we had four minutes. Now, not only is it four minutes, it's four minutes including pistol shooting. So now actual rifle shooting for two guys, which you can't shoot simultaneously. They rarely allow that. Sometimes they will. It depends. I did notice on this last element um, from the last two matches is they've been getting to a thing of separating yeah, primary and secondary. Not a big separation, but enough to where I can't. there's not enough time for me to really run over and help him confirm or give his dope. You're kind of working, working in your own little workspace. Yeah, and that used to not be the case, but I did notice that at Snipers Unknown, there were quite a few stages where they separated you. That way you don't have someone to spot for you. You don't have anyone to give you your dope, so you've got to be self-reliant. But remember, there's a team aspect, so always have your partner's dope. Kenny, anything you'd like to add to that? No, um, you know, for the team style mashup we're doing, we really heavily relied on your secondary shooter to give you your win call. So this is where the marksmanship skills come in handy. You know, rigging the barrage to kind of give you that estimation of five to ten mile wind, and your your secondary obviously relaying that message to you about how much wind he's holding. So, so how me and Ray ran it, we figured out our wind speeds comparing to each other's rifles and figured out we're about you know seventy percent of each other's wind holds. So he'll call out, all right, I'm basically one mil at this this, this distance and. I only have to hold 70% of that, which would be 0.7. So that's how we relate each other's mess or at least our wind calls from that. Yeah. So guys, one of the most important things, if you don't have any takeaways from this, you need a good set of laser range finding binoculars. Also, because you're going to be ranging targets a long ways away, not all of them will, like, let's say you have a circle or a dot in the middle of your laser range finding binos. If it's a small target, it might be this big. So you don't know exactly where your beam dispersion is. You need to practice that with your binos to know. I know on these binos here, I've been running these for about two years. If I want an exact, I want to put it in the top right hand corner of the circle, but every one of them is a little different because that's a big circle on these laser range finding binos. Do you need to know where it is? If you don't know, then at least try to hit the base of the target on something not reflective like the dirt if possible. You noticed with the, uh, the Leicas that I ran, they varied from yeah. the SIGs, and I think I wasn't pinging in the right area. Yeah, it's important to know your equipment for sure. All right, so let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, yes, we are running Feet Who Outdoor Chats. Uh, these are made by Colin Fawlton. He's a really good friend. Uh, I actually do carry some of his map cases on my website, but I don't carry the chaps. You can buy them directly from him. He makes everything himself um, at home and super great shooter. He shoots for blackjack bullets. Uh, I can't say enough good stuff about Colin. Colin's a, a great, great guy. Absolutely. All right. So we've covered all of this. Now we want to have a scope with external turrets. Uh, guys, remember, you're going to be using this equipment hard. 
Um, you don't want anything that's capped. Now, that being said, Matt on this last match was limited to a 10 power optic because he was the secondary shooter. So the optic that we chose was the Vortex Razor HD 1 to 10. And that has capped turrets. He actually just unscrewed the cap and then he dialed a lot of the stone instead of just holding like you normally would because it does track pretty well. Yeah, it, it did. A lot of the stages we held, but there were a few with some where I'm only shooting one distance but five or six targets. I went ahead and just dialed that in because he had to run over and shoot the gas gun as well. Didn't have to fool with holding or any of that. Yeah, uh, let's see here. Hold on. What if you don't turn up at a match but know how to shoot, but if you miss like five inches, is that a fail? I don't quite get it. <laughs> well, I don't know. You yeah, you, you miss a 200-yard target like I did. <laughs> you might come over oh, the yeah. You ain't the only one, Kenny. It happens. It happens. And, and guys, remember, if you're doing a true sniper match, and I've got plenty of videos on this, um, they <coughs> You have what they call dead electronic stages, and they require you to pull the batteries out of anything that has a battery in it, and, mill, and you're going to have to mill those targets. Now, you're not going to be able to mill a target with unknown target sizes. You will – hold on, I have to mute Ken here. There we go. You're going to have to know something, okay? You either have to know distance or you have to know target size in inches – and then you'll have to do your math. Either you're going to use the 27.77 or the 95.1, depending on if you're using MOAs or mills. And you'll have to determine how far those targets are. On a lot of DMR matches, using something that is strictly like a DMR type scope, like a loophole Mark VI, they have known stadia lines so that you can just bracket targets. But you're not going to do that unless it's a... Like a true DMR, they're going to use man-sized steels throughout the whole thing. They're not going to mix little circles and squares of varying sizes because you're having to do this stuff on the fly. So it's uh, it's important to know what you're signing up for because a designated marksman rifle typically <clears throat> doesn't have really, really long. They don't have really long engagements like some of these team matches. Uh, but I know that Matt and I, we were shooting out to four hundred or 1,470 yards um, at this last match and with a lot at 1200, mm -hmm. 12 plus, 1200 plus. All right. So I got Kenny unmuted again. Anything you want to say? No, that's, um, like you're saying, uh, the laser range fire, that's the key must. We, we've seen folks running those, uh, handhelds or using, uh, binos and having some kind of weird tripod system where they had the bino mounted on and then the handheld. So it seemed like that was a little bit too much time as well, too. Yeah. All right, let me mute you again, and I'm going to go down the list some more. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about are pistols. So whether it was a match with Kenny or with Matt, uh, all of these sniper matches usually have some type of pistol element. A pistol with or without a red dot, you need to know. That's going to vary depending on the match, okay? Some matches allow dots, some allow comps, some only allow irons. You want to make sure you have two spare mags. And I always run a battle belt, guys. I know Matt runs the same thing. Uh, my battle belt of choice would be a G-code. And one of the things I like is the RTS wheel. It makes it very easy to connect a holster. Uh, if it's a stage where you don't need a pistol, you can go ahead and take it off. Now, one of the crazy things about this last match was... Yeah, it's, 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 I've not been to one like this before. So. Okay, guys, this last match was a true team sniper match with a lot of military um, of the 41 teams. I would venture to say that 30 plus were nothing but military. Um, once again, you've got Rangers, you had SF, you had Delta, you had scout snipers. Um, your pistol went hot the day you started and it was on you to make sure it was empty when you left home or when you left the, the range. Uh, so from the minute you started that morning, you were able to go ahead and chamber around. Didn't matter if you're going prone. That didn't matter. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest <clears throat> things, and Kenny will be able to speak authoritatively on this, is I use nothing but G-code holsters with a positive retention. There is no physical way for that pistol to come out. I don't care how tight you think you can get these screws here. What's going to happen is your pistol's going to be in here. You're going to go from unslung or take a backpack off, 
and you are going to lose that pistol. Period. End of story, right, Kenny? Yep. So, unfortunately, the, uh, the SVI um, pistol that I had on the first competition dynamics came with a race holster. Um, that ended up popping off. So, basically, I lost my pistol, and luckily, before it was chambered um, during one of the courses. So, yeah, positive retention. I ended up buying a G-code specifically for it, and that has been the best so far. So, positive retention is a must uh, for these type of matches. Yeah, and I'm not going to say that you absolutely have to buy a G-code. There are other companies out there like Weber Tactical, and you can usually uh, get this attach mount. Let me go back to the main screen here so you guys can see. But on the back side, and there's a couple different models of these, but basically they interlock together. So once you place this in here and it drops down, now there's a locking tab. You see it right here. I'm going to press it. And then now this pistol will not come out. This holster will not come off that RTS wheel. I usually use a drop, but let's say it's a stage. I don't want this on me, or I know the next couple stages don't have a pistol. I'll take this off, make sure the pistol's clear, and I'll throw up my pack. That way I don't have something else to deal with on my side. So this is a great setup. Um, as far as using any of this stuff, actually, I still have one of Matt's on here. I have a place for three pistol mags and then two rifle mags. Now, these do break. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Under hard use, you're going to snag them. And if you see that white zip tie there, that's what's holding that one on. I know that Kenny broke three of his, I believe, at the match out west. Yeah, grab mine. Here is... Matt's right here. His setup is very similar. He's got two of the G codes. He's got three of the pistol mags. Uses a Cobra buckle up front and same style holster, but no positive retention. Nope. Remember, he was running that X5 Legion of mine. And so we had to come up with a holster. I had to do some modifying, but we had to make sure that that pistol didn't come out. Yeah, you had, you had to be, be very gone. aware. There were some stages where you got to leave your pack. You know, and then and then go up to the stage. But then there was some where you had to take all your gear, ditch your gear and then get into position. So every time I stripped the pack off, I just made sure it did not snag the butt of that gun. Yeah. And there was a question here um, from Brian. He said, did you actually lose it or simply fall out and you found it? No. Uh, yeah. These are big boy rules at some of these matches. OK, this isn't USPSA and you turned with a loaded pistol or something like that. I mean, you still have some 180s, but on some of these, you're going to have rolling 260s and 300. Yeah. Um, it is, in, in a real scenario, you got to remember the people that we're competing against. In a real scenario, you're not going to say, well, stop, you're done, your pistol just fell out. You pick it up, you dust it off, you put it back in your holster, and you get back to work. Right. And, uh, you know, there, what people don't know is there's uh, like four or five ROs that are following you the whole time to ensure safety. I mean, you're not having just a set of ROs to um, ensure safety. They were running with you the whole time. So what happened to me, and like I said, this is the kind of things we're going through. We're, we're jumping in and out of tires, uh, tractor tires. We're jumping in and out of vehicles. Literally, these are things that on a USPSA match uh, that we went to in two, yeah, two gun. Uh, you're not really doing a lot of body moving mechanics or going through things. Um, you know, this type of assault stages that we're doing required a lot of body movement. So your gear does get uh, really, really tested. Uh, for instance, like I said, I broke two mag holsters from the G-Code. Um, you know, that was just something that happened. But, you know, uh, to, to sure safety, like I said, that was really nice to see four or five ROs following follow us. I was able to pick up my, um, my pistol and re or reholster it before I got to the chamber line. So that that was another safety issue that we, uh, we were able to mitigate. Yeah, now guys, keep in mind, and Gagabytes has a good question here. It says, if you don't have a retaining strap, are you required to put a safety on? Um, it's a good idea to do that, but as long as you don't have a negligent discharge, any type of negligent just discharge at a match is gonna get you out of it. Uh, that's it, plain and simple. But in some of these matches remember these aren't your normal weekend matches um, and, and i get it from both points of view is depending on who's who's running the match and try to keep it as real world as possible and if something happens and you lose your weapon you pick it up as long as it if you just keep on going right that's it it is what it is all right as far as 
I'm going to talk about this next one because this is a, a product that I invented and actually, well, I'm going to say invent, but I have a manufacturer and I use them. Okay, so until you guys started doing these matches, and this is, uh, this is something that I have made here in Western North Carolina. Uh, it is made by a plastics company here locally, and I sell these on the website, but people don't realize how valuable these things are. Uh, Kenny, let me get your thoughts on this. And I'm not trying to sell them. I, I don't care about selling them. I'm just telling you why you need something like this. So, well, this all goes back to the communication part and that tool that you came up with Honestly, I don't know if anything else is better than that. That thing is centralized on your tripod. So basically we have either Ray's tripod or my tripod and we're drawing out, we're mapping out the targets. Um, while we're mapping out the targets, we're putting our, our dopes on there. We're not putting the yardage, we're putting our dopes. So he will circle his dope and I will put mine underneath his. So it is a very valuable communication tool to have, not only as a reference for uh, target acquisition, but something to where when uh, He's so for instance, he's on secondary engaging the targets. You could walk him in, you can you could show him, hey, we found a humpback, which is a um, you know, a type of terrain or something that we found that, that's easy to spot. Draw it on there, draw the target where it is, and reference off of that. Um, we we're able to basically walk each other in very quickly. And like I said, communication is key for these matches. I think it was turtleback. <laughs> yeah, turtleback. yeah, that's what it was, turtleback. I didn't know what a turtleback was until uh he told me after that stage. <laughs> All right, let me get uh, Matt's thoughts on this. I want to mute you for just a second. All right, so the way we use this, guys, and what I did was I just put a piece of uh, bungee on this, and then these little quick carabiners make it essential because Kenny and I actually shot in the wind one time, and it was so bad that the data card came off. So basically, I will strap this to it so that I can't lose it, and then once we set the tripod up, basically... I've got something to write on and I always have a pen holder here. Don't use wet or uh, dry erase because you're going to lose your data when you don't plan on it. Um, I'm a big fan of these Statlers. Uh, these Statlers will dry and you can use this marker, this, uh, this hard bristle on the back to be able to remove it. Uh, so it'll wipe away initially, but after about 10 seconds, it dries on there pretty hard. What'd you think about the data card? Oh, it was a game changer for me. Uh, I think the first, the first time I used one was the second stage where I, could, I was able to run up and shoot pistol. He was already on binos recording distances based off of landmarks. And then when I came over to him, he was already on the gun. I literally read off the board and then we swapped out. I mean, it made it so, so easy. Um, I don't think there's anything better out there. Yeah, there might be a better way to do it, but for now, that seems to be the fastest way, regardless of who you're shooting with. And remember to be versatile. You know, I've shot both secondary position as well as primary position. And if you're going to shoot that with someone, make sure they can handle that role. Uh, not everyone can shoot a gas gun that well. Not everyone can shoot a bolt gun that well. Try to put them on what they do best or what they're most comfortable with. Uh, there's a question by Jerry Parker. Have I ever shot the Lago Alien? Yes, I did a review on that not even a year ago. So that video is up and out there. Brian asks, how many hours do the people running the matches work per day? How many miles do they cover in a day and do they get paid for their work? Mm. Brian, there is so much work <laughs> into putting in a match or putting together a match. So I know a lot of you guys might look at this. I did have some questions. Somebody said, man, it's $600 to shoot that match. Because you don't understand how many ROs and volunteers moving steel, moving targets, scoring the targets goes into putting in one of these matches. So when you do the math and you say, oh, man, that's a $20,000 match. What does the match director do with all that money? you're usually out there a week beforehand and you're having to put these guys up in hotels. It's usually not paid. What they'll do is they'll provide food for them and some type of housing. And a lot of them are volunteers from either like the schoolhouse from like down in Benning. And a lot of them do this for work as sniper instructors for either Marine Corps or the U S army. So having guys like that, especially like at snipers unknown and at this last match is a huge benefit and a big shout out to those guys that put in the work because you couldn't do these matches otherwise. All right. So let me make sure I'm caught up on everything here. All right, Jonathan Choi, my pleasure. All right. So we're going to continue on. 
So we talked about the data card. We talked about the arm bag or the uh, armband. Let's talk about rear bags because this is not PRS, guys. You don't want to show out there, show up there with your your OG game changer. I wanted to. That that weighs eight to ten pounds. I wanted to. When you're yeah. trying to make your stuff as light as possible, make yourself as nimble as possible. He did want to, but. And I'm not saying you can't, but just remember, you're adding a lot of weight. It would have sucked. And it would have sucked for sure. But I'll tell you what I used. Hold on. I, I ended up taking a pint-sized game changer, a sticky pint-sized game changer. It was light. Yeah, so this is the fortune cookie by WeBad. And this has the Get Light Fill. It's super light, so I don't know what's there. You might say, well, why do you have two carabiners on here? One of my biggest things is I hate something on my pack doing this. It just it just aggravates the heck out of me. So usually what I'll do is I'll just strap one to the top, one to the bottom. These little orange ones here, you can actually buy these from Walmart. They're quiet. They're super light. They're $2. Uh, it's not like the real ones like this, but I don't need uh, I don't need this. I just needed something quick. So this is the bag that I use. I can use it as a rear bag. I can use it for a barricade position. It's really, really versatile. And we used it for both of those. And we did. And then I also took with me this super, super light, which this actually weighs less than the other one. This is by Armageddon Gear. And I don't remember the model of this. Yeah, but you carried a large one. I carried this one. Yeah, I think I carried the the big ass fat bag or watch your language. Whatever it's 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 the way it's called. I know, I'm just messing. And I strapped that to the back of the pack and um and we, we utilize every piece of equipment. So. Yeah. So, guys, remember, you're not going to be shooting off of your belly. They're going to have you in these matches shooting out of vehicles, shooting off barricades. And anytime you can brace an arm or sit on this or stand on this, it's going to make you have a higher percentage of hits on your shots. So why wouldn't you carry it? Super lightweight. I never run these in my pack. It takes up way too much space. I usually just attach it to the rear once again with two carabiners that keep it from swinging around. Yep. Kenny? Yeah, that, that pump pillow is probably the only time I've used that freaking thing. Honestly, even on a PRS match, I barely use those pump pillows. Uh, just me. You know, I just shoot off of medium. But during this match, we've used that thing quite often, honestly, as leverage. Uh, there's a lot of times where we're shooting off a little boulder just to get over a tree line, for instance, on the first competition dynamics. And that pump pillow came in handy as a rear support um, yep. many times for both of us. So that's a great tool to have. It's very light. You can lose it. So make sure your carabiner is clipped on. Um, so that's just something you, you won't notice it. It's, like I said, it's a very light, lightweight little pillow. Yeah, they, they look big, but they're weight. Yeah, they're, they're light. Yeah, they're, they're to them. yeah, and with the benefit they'll give you, you got to remember – and you guys aren't aware of this. I'm going to go ahead and mention this because uh, Matt has shared it now. I actually talked to Greg Hamilton, uh, who actually won the last match at Coleman's Creek. Now, him and Sean Murphy, those guys, like I said, they really are monsters. Those guys are pretty much the team to beat all across the country. Mm -hmm. And we looked at how we finished. And even though we came in seventh place, we could have easily – came in third, fourth, or fifth, or sixth. Um, there were really only about two targets that separated that whole group. Now, you got to remember, some targets have different weighting based on how far it was or if it's a pistol target. You know, pistol targets were two points. Some rifle targets, like long range, were eight points for primary. Your secondary were like five. Some were more for first round, then second round, got an X amount, and then third, fourth, or whatever. How many of rounds after that were only worth a couple points? Um, yeah. So it was that close. Um, so we were happy that we got into the top 10, but it just gets that close. So anything you can carry with you that's not going to be a, um, a detriment to your speed or movement, why wouldn't you have it? Mm hmm uh, let's talk about spotting scopes. Let me get you guys this. Uh, Kenny, I'm going to get your thoughts on having a spotting scope or carrying one. Um, for the matches that we've done, I mean, our target engagements went out to the longest one was 970 yards in the first CD match. Majority of the shots are about 400 to 700 yards. Uh, some poked out to 800 and some yards in the wind. You know, we're shooting in canyons. 
Rick you know, honestly, Rick this is scope man. is a little bit too much magnification to carry. Honestly, those those binos is really all you need. It would be, and I'm waiting for somebody besides um, Steiner to come out with two tenth incremental reticles inside the binos. That's that's what we really need is, is something like that. Binos with some reticle in there. But that's uh. So yeah, at this match, we did carry a spotting scope. There is, there can be a time and place to have one. I typically don't carry one on the match, but I knew there were some really long range targets at 1400 ish yards. And so Matt did carry one in his pack because that does give us the ability to be able to give a correction almost instantly. And remember when you're spotting, be directly behind the shooter. Okay. You don't want to be offset. The more offset you are, the more parallax error there is in telling that person whether they were left or right. And uh, we actually have what, Mr. Rick in here with us. What the hell? You got a suntan. Look, so got is your six bone. covered? Has <laughs> just gotten home. So um, 14 hours of drive. 14 hours of drive. Well, it's good to have you back. Good Lordy. So there is a question here from Buddy D. He says, looking at a second Thank rifle, you. six arc or six Creedmoor. Uh, they are both great options, but it depends on what you're trying to do with it. Kenny, why don't you chime in on this? I'm going to give you the give you the floor. So, regardless of whatever caliber you're using, uh, it is very beneficial to know the ins and out of that caliber. Meaning, knowing during the morning when it's cold, like the six arc uses a very temper uh, temperature sensitive powder. So, it is key fact to know that your your loads or your hand loads or if you're shooting factory ammo, will shoot lower in the morning or shoot a certain way, regardless of what caliber you use. There's a lot of guys using Dasher, a lot of guys using 6BR. Obviously, we use 6ARC. Um, the 6 caliber, 6 millimeter caliber class seem to dominate as majority for what people shot out there. Um, what we notice is maybe there's a little bit of slight advantage with the heavier calibers, like the 6 Creedmoor and a 115 DTAC, simply for the fact of not being, you know, having your wind holds a little less. Uh, so as long as you're proficient of what you know how to, you know, you know how to shoot, um, we're talking like MOA targets at 700 yards hidden in the bushes. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, honestly, I, I think we're going to try the six creed more for the next match, just because me and him are, you know, we both know what the six creed more can do. Yeah, well, and <laughs> you know, I just think that often. Um, but either one of those calibers work very well. <laughs> Sorry, Rick walked in here for three minutes, disconnected us, and we lost all video feed in here. So hopefully we're still live. <laughs> Surprise! All right. So, yeah. So, like Kenny was saying, I mean, you really need to. I like them both. I love the six arc. Uh, however, for like my ATX that I've been shooting, I can't go with a six arc in that platform because I cannot get a different bolt head. Yes, I could do that in the TLR and uh, the TL3 action from Bighorn, but I like that ATX platform. I want to continue to shoot it. So I think Kenny is, uh, we're talking about uh, building a BR for that. So that way I can just use the same bolt face uh, that I've got, but then I have an option as a PRS caliber. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, like we were having some weird scenarios where 300 yards, we're shooting to a canyon with an updraft. So these are things that, you know, if, unless you practice it, you're not going to really know how to shoot it. Because there's a couple canyons with updrafts where we're changing the elevation. Don't have an answer. Answer so. what? All right, so this is a great question by Chris Davis, and I am going to let Matt P answer this. I don't know where he went in the video. Where are you at? Right, hold on a second, guys. Don't know what happened. Turn the camera. Which one? This one? Oh, is when you knocked it, it changed oh, all man. of our camera settings. It, it killed it. That's why. All right. How do you walk your teammate to a target with communication? <laughs> well, when we were firing on all cylinders, um, at least at this match, they had some targets set up on what I consider pretty good landmarks. They had like old beat up cars out there. There might have been a big pine. Well, there's a ton of big pines, but one had like a two on it. And we use that 
as like a starting point for a landmark. And then some of the targets ran across the ridge. Uh, what I learned basically using a clock face is how I was supposed to do it. I think I did that on some and then some I did not do that because he's trying to find these targets in his scope. I'm looking through a pair of binos with no reticle, no anything, and I can see him clear as day, but he's he has reticle to deal with. So I would say clock face would be the most ideal way to uh, walk your partner in. Yeah, so I'm going to agree with this. What I've found to be pretty effective, and sorry about that, guys. We're on a different camera now. It switched over. What I found to be very, very effective is if you can both get on glass, and I always recommend both of you having tripods. Hold on. Look. You know what? Give me just a moment. I apologize. Let me see if I can switch over to the audio and go back yeah, to, to this. Camera. Camera. Yeah, I'm going to the phone first because it killed that one. Now we're going to go to camera. Give me just a minute. All right. Let's see if this works. Yep. All right. So I should be back now. Yeah, there we go. Give me just a second. Let me thank Rick for that. Knock the whole uh, electrical box off. But anyway, so if you can both get on glass and you both have your tripods, that's going to be your, your most steady. Whoever finds the target first, that's usually a good time. Let's say I'm scanning and I find a target. Well, what I need to do is find something on the horizon that he can see or some noticeable landmark out there. And I might say, Matt, do you see that high point there? Mm -hmm. Let's come straight down six o'clock or I could say come down towards seven o'clock and, you know, look on that ridge. Once he sees that, we've established our first target. Then you can go left, right, like a clock face. From there, we can start scanning, and then he can say, all right, 3 o'clock from the first target, there's another target at 625. We can be drawing this out. So what you're doing is you're mapping out your targets. Now, in some matches, especially initially doing this, if there's eight targets, you might only find four or five. At some point, you might say, that's good enough. We need to get on the guns and hit those targets. Mm -hmm. We don't want to spend five out of the six available minutes looking for targets because now we're going to have time to shoot them. And it gets better, too. Some stages, they might have had squares, circles, or diamonds. Correct. And you can relay that to your partner as well or draw it out. Yeah. $2. I want my $2. That's from Better Off Dead with John Cusack. It's a great movie. All right. What if people can't read? <laughs> that would a clock on cat work. Well, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave that one alone. Pick a different partner. <laughs> he said pick a different partner. All right. You so better find a new partner. What's that? You better find a new partner. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so we don't utilize the Kestrels a lot. If there's a huge temperature change, enough to where you're completely changing out your, your clothing or taking off a layer of clothing, that might be a good time to verify, but you're not going to be able to do this before every stage. This is not PRS. Big temperature swings, too. If you start at maybe mid-morning, you're starting off 40s, and then by the end of the day, it might be in the 70s, might be a good time to maybe try to spin up. Yeah. When it starts to get a little warmer, see if you get a big variation. And, and don't rewrite this. You mm -hmm. just have to remember you're a tenth low or you're a tenth high, and you're just going to add it to everything. Yeah. This is your guideline. And then you'll have to make corrections according to that, because this is, remember, your dope charts are never an absolute. That's always going to change throughout the day. So you got your Kestrel. You want to make sure you have some water. Sometimes they'll provide water on stages, but I can't tell you how many matches I've been to where they told you they were going to provide water and you go there and the water jugs are all empty and there's no drinks. Make sure you have some type of snacks. Almost everybody carries some type of beef jerky or something like that. Or if you're me, you carry a lot of chocolate, so it melts in the bag. Um, you also want to make sure that your backpack, what I run for a backpack, you want to make sure it's kind of light. Uh, guys, this is a mystery ranch. This is the two day assaulters pack. I think Matt was running the three day assaulters pack. And then one of the other things that I do and everybody that I know has kind of adopted this that shoot in my circles. So when you put your tripod in this water bottle pouch, you put the legs in here. These little twisty ties that you can get from Walmart, I think Night Eyes makes them or whatever, they're really cheap. 
This just goes around the head of the tripod. You turn it one time, that's it. She doesn't go anywhere. Um, they're really grippy and they work super well. I can't think of a faster way to hold my tripod. I don't think there is any in the bag. Better. Yeah, there's not a better way. I don't want a scabbard. I don't want it inside of the bag itself. I want it to be accessible on the outside. If they're staging, you can go ahead and extend them and it's, and it's good to go. All right. We'll see here. For some reason. Oh, yeah. Matt, <laughs> no. Um, Ken, Kenny is muted right now, but he's he's done that to himself. Uh, eye and ear pro. You want to make sure you have eye and ear pro. Kenny, are you locked up? Let's see. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, we're good now. We're still got you. How to watch your teammate on target. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, sorry about that. We already answered that one. Uh, no, it was just I couldn't bring you back. I couldn't bring you back in, but uh, you're, you're here now. For a beginner, what is the least expensive way to start caliber-wise? 308, 65 Grendel, Creedmoor, Arc, Creedmoor, 243 was cheaper before, but I think 308 is the same now, cheapest to reload. Take it away, Kenny. Uh, well, you know, honestly, we know that the 6 Arc and the AR-15 – is that is dominant i mean it just was hammering out there honestly if you're going to shoot this match go in the mindset that make first round impacts regardless if you're secondary or primary that's how you're going to you know basically make efficiency in your time now from what i've seen the factory hornady six millimeter creedmoor ammunition if you want to go cheap not have to worry about reloading and all that that may be the way to go you can go in there with the typical remington 700 chamber and six creedmoor um we're seeing more and more these days uh you know we've seen folks run, run, walk out there with uh was it a 308 rifle shooting federal or the federal uh you know the xm 109s or whatever it was that the, the, the military 308 and still have fun you, you, you could go there and with factory ammo and a factory rifle but to be competitive um to be honest the hand loads are the way to go you know maybe a custom rifle or something that you uh, put together with a rebarrel so you can easily take a factory rifle like I did, took a typical Savage 10 short action and uh, rebarreled with the six arc and just went out there and practice. So um, I think the biggest benefit to it is just going out there and practicing with the rifle that you have and knowing exactly, you know, when I mean practice is making first round impacts. Go out there and have a friend, and this is what was, what was uh, for me, I had a friend go out there, set up targets at random distances, kind of doesn't tell me where we are, and I went and hunted, you know, was uh, using my binos to try to search for them and try to make first round impacts. So if you're really debating about going these matches, that's a great way to uh, learn about your target acquisition and know how well you can shoot with your rifle. Yeah, thanks for that, Kenny. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, guys, is it is a learned skill. The very first time you ever do a blind stage match, um, I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to say you're going to suck, but you're going to think that you suck because you're only going to find half of these targets. Depending on the region that you shoot in, whether let's say you're on the East Coast and then all of a sudden you go out to the desert and you're not look, used to looking at these ter this terrain with these valleys, uh, especially because they don't paint the targets for you. Um, these are usually rusted targets. You're going to be like, and I know Rick even said this, the very first time I took Rick out to a team safari match, he was like, I just couldn't find the targets. And you can't say it's right beside of the green tree because there's 20,000 green trees in front of your little bushes, you know, you know, the sage or whatever it is, um, or the junipers. You've got to know all of this and be able to know that terrain to be able to tell which features these are. You can't say that big rock there because there's 50,000 other rocks out there. You got to be very, very specific. But that learning curve happens very quickly. I mean, the very first time you do it, you're not going to be too good at it but then you only get better at it. The other thing is I wanted to address uh, Aaron Edwards asked about the magazines that I'm running with the Cobalt 6 Arc. We've made some huge progress. I will tell you that there's a DMR that will be hitting the market. Uh, Kenny is very aware of this as well. Uh, we've been working with Cobalt pretty heavily and yep. there is a 22 inch barrel that shoots sub half minute all day long with factory ammo. I'm very, very impressed with it. And I have been running nothing but the Duramags. Um, there have been some changes within the barrel as far as the gas system and all that. So it's not like you're just going to throw one together. It's very specific on how this is done. Um, 
in collaboration with the barrel company and i'm pretty impressed with it kenny knows exactly what i'm talking about right yeah this is a it's a project and you know obviously those who follow my channel know i've been working with the six r is a wildcat for a long time so very glad to see the progress um, i see more and more videos and more popularity in this cartridge and it's a game changer um from what we're seeing it, it is one of those calibers that just buck the wind and shoot straight so i'm glad to see what cobalt and kinetics when they release that you guys will be able to get a hold of one of those it's going to be a very awesome competition rifle all right night brad we'll see you brad all right so a couple more things here uh, you do want a sunshade for your scope. I don't run a long sunshade. You guys know that. I just use a drink koozie. It works really, really well. Um, I actually had to use it in the match with myself and Matt. Um, it's super, it's compact, and it keeps you from dinging your objective. So, you know, just keep it simple. Uh, the other thing you want is if you're doing a true ruck match, you want to make sure you bring a change of clothes. Uh, if you're starting off and you're doing a ruck match that has ruck par times, uh, let's say you've got to cover five miles at 15 minutes a mile. And let's say you don't make that. You're going to be huffing it pretty good, especially with a 50 plus pound pack. Uh, it's really hard to get your pack below 40 ish. Okay. With the rifle and all. So if you are keeping that kind of pace at 30 something degrees, and then all of a sudden you get there, you're going to be soaking wet. Well, the temperature, if it doesn't come up and it's still in the thirties, you're going to, going to freeze or, or die one, right? So make sure you bring a change of clothes, change of socks. Um, it depends on the match that you're shooting. A lot of these ruck matches are going to happen in the fall and the spring when it's still real cold instead of in the dead heat of summer. You also want some type of food kit. You guys know that I'm actually the only other dealer in the U.S. for the uh, Borka kits. Um, hold on, let me switch screens here. Yep. Sorry. Here we go. The Borka kits. And I usually take a lot of this stuff out, but this has everything I need to work on a gun or a rifle that I need to, but there's a lot of stuff in here. I'm not going to need that's extra. So I'll take that out, but always have a toolkit with you. And one, one other thing is a clean microfiber towel, not one right out of the pack because that always has this residue. So if you use a lens and you haven't washed that microfiber, it'll leave little, um, what is it look like? It's like little, like, little hairs yeah. all over it. So make sure you have a clean one. And that's really good for, uh, let me bring Kenny back in here. That's really good for um, wiping lenses off, things like that. But don't share that if you're wiping any sweat off, okay? The other thing is, is your shoes. Make sure you have something with somewhat of a rigid sole. Um, uh, while I love ultras, and it's a great shoe for running. It's not a great shoe for running in rocks. So I'm not telling you boots. Uh, make sure you have something that has more of a rigid sole. I've been using a lot of the own clouds. Uh, I know you use a lot of the Keens. Keens are good. And then Rick, I think, Solomon. uses the Hocus. I can't wear Hocus. Uh, Salomons are too narrow. So let's see here. Dorgan and Sky had a neat hook system. Yes, they did on their sling for sure which we could not find. And we even actually asked them, how long can you bear your shoulders? Me with a 10 pound pack, then an 18 pound rifle broke me in half. Yeah. I mean, Rick used his PRS rifle in one of these matches and it literally killed him. Damn near. He said, damn near. <laughs> so is that sub half minute arc out of a gas gun? Yes, it is Brian. And this wasn't, just one or two groupings. Uh, I'll actually just show you real time. Uh, this was the Did results. Recently? Yeah, this was the results yesterday. So this is the worst group at a 0.48. That's a five shot group. Uh, this is a 0.39 five shot group at 105 yards, actually. And this is shooting Hornady Black. This is another five shot group. It only gets better. Uh, so we've been really working with this and working with um, with a company. The barrel's actually not even out yet in the length that we're testing it in, which is a 22 inch. Uh, we got two prototypes in and uh, yeah, so a lot of progress that way. So now we're going to change gears for just a second. And what I want to talk about now is mindset. So almost all of these team sniper matches are going to be blind stages. You need to be open minded when possible on who can shoot first. 
Some of the matches require the secondary, and the reason I'm pointing at Matt is he was secondary at the last match. But some of them say secondary must go first. Once he's done and he comes off the rifle, he cannot go back to it again, and now it's just primary. That wasn't the case at this last match. At this last match, they left a lot of stages open for you to decide who was going to shoot first. If that's the case, you need to look at his rate of fire. One of the things you guys didn't know about the Coleman's Creek is we had many stages that had limited round counts. He was limited to 20 rounds. I was limited to 10. Regardless of how many targets were out there. Some were less. Yeah, some were actually less where he had 10 and I had, let's say, eight. Five. Exactly, five. So if it's something where I'm like, man, he, he's got 20 rounds, he can – you know, fire multiple rounds at one target, even though it might be further and you might have a inferior caliber because he was shooting a 223. I've got to look at the rate of fire that he can put down to be able to get those impacts. So be open minded about it. anything you want to add to that. No. All right. The other thing is you want to manage your time properly with a stopwatch. So we used just a regular stopwatch. Now, the good thing about these Garmin's is I can set it for a X amount of part time. And it will not only buzz on the wrist, but it will beep because there's so much going on. A lot of times it's easy to miss. You're not going to miss this going off. Um, having something else, and I've tried these other timers, they're just too difficult. It's easier just to have something on your wrist and always factor in your pistol times. I know one of the biggest things we messed up on was we thought we didn't do it the first few stages. We didn't use the timer and we overestimated on some things yeah and we got done with pistol way too fast and we could have stayed on the rifles maybe another 30 seconds and then shot about 10 seconds worth of pistol yeah maybe have gotten another impact or two who knows but the other thing is guys you need to be a very good pistol shooter um at most of these team sniper matches you're not shooting ipsix at 15 and 20 yards uh, there was one stage where the closest target was 60 to 70 yards. That's what I estimated. 10 targets, and they were six and eight inch deals. You got to remember, those were two points each. So, with 10 targets out there, you're going to be giving up 20 points on a stage if you don't hit those in the amount of time. So, what I've seen at most of these sniper matches, you can regularly expect targets from 50 to 100 yards with pistol. So, make sure you're on top of your pistol game. Mm -hmm. would you agree 100 percent? oh yeah no I, when we ran up on that one stage and they were down in the valley what i thought about 60 ish yards maybe a little bit more i'll say uh oh <laughs> yeah kenny let me get your thoughts on pistol because you weren't that big of a pistol shooter yeah so um the, honestly so the matches that we've done together that seemed to be where you can really get your points and get ahead of the game your pistol shooting on these uh, these assault stages is what sets uh, you as a team apart from all the others. The top guys in all these uh, team uh, kind of TD matches are, you know, it's like like you're saying, it's a very rarity to see a good a rifle shot as well as a pistol shot. Um, so having your pistol game up there is going to help benefit you. So don't just practice your rifle game, definitely your pistol game, because that's where the majority of the points will get caught up for you. Yeah, I agree. Need to be strong on that pistol. What I've seen so much of is going to these matches and guys are great rifle shots and then they go through two magazines trying to hit pistol and lose a lot of time. Um, you know, I, I hosted a couple matches myself and put them on at the Clinton house. We did a big DMR down there and I had smaller targets, but they weren't crazy far. And there were instances of guys going through 20 and 30 rounds trying to hit some of these. And even at the last match, they had us do support hand only. I had a stage like that and we had guys zero out on that stage and it was just like, whoa, you know, that's a point. It's a point. It's the same as shooting that rifle target at 700 yards. You're missing it with your pistol at 15. And I've never shot a lot with a dot either, Kenny. And when they made us do strong hand, we can, I was like, I got this. It was like a little Sasquatch target. It didn't seem too bad. And that dot was shaking around. So like, it was, you, I wish you could have seen the dot. It was just hopping. Yeah. So uh, L.A. to BKK asked a great question. He says, I remember your match videos. You stated target acquisition with the binos is 90 percent of the game. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? Finding target? I, I think 90 percent of the game is communication. OK, um, so you're saying communication. Yeah, I, I would go with communication. But yeah, uh, 
my first time really I've looked through binos when we're out doing PRS stuff, but never searching for targets at unknown distances that are camouflage. Yep. Um, you got to be pretty spot on with that. <laughs> yeah. Kenny, what are it's your thoughts on this? Um, finding the targets is obviously the key factor. Or what's the number one priority when, when that time goes off. Um, communication, like, like uh, Matt was saying, is key. I think um, time management is basically what helps you, uh, you know, you know like, like what you're doing, right? You're setting a certain amount of time for you to engage your first three. And if you go ahead you know, off that time, you know for sure that, Either I got 30 seconds to make all six hits or whatnot, but time management and your communication, I think, is um, you know is more important than just finding the targets. Because there's times where we didn't find all the targets, and obviously mm-hmm. you knew that hey, I got to get on his rifle and make my hits. And while you're doing that, you're able to spot your own misses and whatnot while I hunt for the other targets. So um, I think that's uh, to me the biggest point for that. Unless you have someone like Ray who's so good at finding them, you just have him do it all. No. <laughs> it's only because, like I said, it's a learned skill, and you'll get better yeah. and better at it the more you do it. Uh, Wes, Wesley Flanagan asked if I'm in North Carolina, and yes, I'm in Western North Carolina. The name of the store, I'll put it at the bottom in the comments. It's xringcustoms.com. Uh, we do make everything here in Western North Carolina. It's all made in the USA. Um that's if you're not familiar there's there's something else and you guys that have been following the channel know what this is let me switch it over so you guys can see this uh, this is something that we all carry as well and this is called the bad mf unfortunately uh it's the bullet and data management folder i'm completely out of these at the moment because we just fulfilled a huge order and so i should have these in in the next month or so along with some other things but this was an invention that I patented and came up with because I was so tired of disorganization in my pack. Um, one of the things Matt said was I need to be able to carry my ammo. I need to have a way to carry ammo because you can only, you're not going to carry like you were secondary. Mm-hmm. You're not going to carry, you know, eight 30 round mags with you and make sure you take some twenties with you as well, guys, because you don't want that long uh, length in there. And at the same time, I'm not going to carry 200 rounds of primary um, ammunition with me. So this was this was basically invented because of that need. And before you guys call it a man purse and everything else, this will attach to the back of a pack using uh, malice clips, or you can just drop it in the bag. That's why I put these handles on here. So no matter how it ends up in a pack, you can still pull it out. I have the Kestrel right where I need it. And then this opens up. I'm not trying to sell these. I don't have any. So uh, right now we're completely out of them, but this gives me a way to carry. And I'm, this is going to be impossible to hold you guys and show you, but this gives me a way to carry extra ammo. I can hold 120 rounds of ammo. I can carry spare mags in here, AICS mags. I have data card holders. I actually have batteries that I keep in these other pockets right here. And this is all mil spec. We Mill spec batteries. fabrics, we used them. We had alcohol wipes. I had different pens in here, batteries, grease pencils, and it just gives me a way to keep everything organized. And the guys that do PRS, Colin with Fehu Outdoors makes these, and these go inside of it. So if you have a matchbook for PRS, you've got everything right there, and you can write on this with a grease pencil as well. So just having organization so that you're not wasting unnecessary time is, is half the game. No, oh, yeah. You got to know where everything's at. Everything is a big part of it. It's just putting it all together and piecing it together where it flows flawlessly. You yeah. Know, the spotting, the communication, your gear setup, everything. It all, it's all a big factor. But All right, guys, so I'm almost done with the list. We'll be wrapping up the show here in just a minute. But a couple other things. Remember, it's a team match. Don't be afraid that if your partner doesn't know where the target is, that you grab his butt stock and you point his muzzle in the right direction because you might see that target, but you've got to remember looking out of a scope with one eye is going to be really, really hard to see because of your field of view, even if you have the power down. And a lot of times it's just a matter of reaching over and pointing his rifle in that direction and boom, they're right on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't get upset. If he touches your turret to dial in your next dope, you can't get pissed about it. It's a team match. He's trying to help you. 
And right. uh, you know, you see a lot of people argue back and forth. And it's like, dude, is this a team or is it an individual match? What is it? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's <laughs> – I don't know. Like, we saw that quite often. A lot of folks got pretty, pretty pissed off. But um, you also got to be humble, too. Like, ask for help when you're saying, hey, man, don't just sit there wasting time trying to find a target. Be like, hey, dude, I can't find it. Help me. And, yeah. You know, Open communication. I can't find it. Point me. Get me on target. We did that on one stage. Yeah, we actually did. Um, the other thing is, like, if I tell Matt, if we know the sequence and we're going from near to far, if I say, you know, next target, I don't need to know the yardage. Okay. <laughs> That's going to mean nothing to me. What I need from him is that dope because I'm not going to have that whiteboard in front of me. So if I've just engaged that first target, let's say 380, and I hit it, and I go to the next target that we've already discussed. We knew exactly where it was at. We knew the order because we're going from near to far. He just needs to tell me 2.3. Boom, I'm on it. If I miss, so what? He'll give me the next correction or say you were on the wrong target. It's just communicating back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. The other thing is, is you want to be somewhat conditioned for the match you're signing up for. I'm not saying you need to be a marathon runner. But like in Kenny's case, when we were preparing for Burris, he had to train for that. When we went to this last match, this was not supposed to be a hiking match. They even said in the description, this will not test your physical ability, but we still ended up hiking and rucking about a mile Yeah, up a big hill. Yeah, it, it wasn't terrible. It felt good to, after we shot a stage and we walked to the next one, we, we discussed, okay, what worked good, what didn't work good. Um, we could go over some gear stuff if we needed to top off a couple mags or I could reach in his pack. He could reach in my pack. So I, I liked that aspect of it. Yeah. But um, yeah. And I don't mind that, but just know what you're signing up for. So let me make sure that we've got all these questions answered. What pistol did you put the Vortex on, DW? Okay, they're having another conversation in there. So, yes, Kenny is uh, supposedly getting a uh, Cobalt. Also, somebody asked if you were going to get one or not. I said, I think you're working on it. Working on it. I also think having a leader in the team is a critical factor. Uh, yes and no. You should really be working together. Right? It really shouldn't be one person just calling all the shots because you have to be they'll open. Set, they'll set it up where you can't. One person can't, especially at this last one. Yeah. They separated us on a couple and I was, you know, kind of bummed on some because I was like, man, Ray, you know, Ray, he's done so many of these and I really look to him for for a little help here and there. Yeah. yeah, it's been a lot, a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. You know, I just, yeah, you know, my whole thing is just trying to get other people, you know, try to be more of an ambassador for the sport. Yeah, I can do individual matches, but getting guys like Kenny, who's out West, who's a great gun builder. I mean, he builds a lot of my rifles. Getting him that aspect of competition only makes him a, a more knowledgeable gunsmith and a shooter. Matt's always been a three gunner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting him involved, this was your first Ruck style match. Yep. Rick, same thing. And, you know, now it's not, we're just one trick ponies. It's you're doing all these other disciplines, everything from ELR 22 to hell, even the, uh, the match we shot that was a blind 22 match. It just gives us a lot of versatility because you never, you know, you don't want to just, I'm not going to sign up for that. That's a blind stage match. Some guys refuse to shoot blind stage matches. Well, I feel like every discipline that we have gotten into, at least that I've gotten into over the last few years, has helped me in one way, shape, or form yeah. into the next one. Well, Correct. the three grand crosses over to the, the team matches for pistol. Yeah, yeah. that's where it helped me so, with pistol is all the, all the three gun stuff. But And going back to three gun, you get way better at positional shooting uh, off of stuff. And, and hit absolutely. The PRS-22 yeah, helped with longer. building a quick, a quick support area. Yeah, guys, it really does all play into it. You know, even if you're big into three gun, you don't do a lot of, you know, let's say team matches or PRS doing a little bit of, let's say, ELR-22, that's going to make you a better shooter when it comes to shooting your three-gun targets uh, out at distance. I know that there's yeah, a big match nice. coming up at Clinton House called the ADM. It's the American Defense Manufacturing. I think that's coming up in March of this year. That's supposed to be 650 rounds 
a two day three gun match and they're going to have engagements all the way out to 700 yards. So even if you're nothing but a big three gunner, you're going to benefit from having that positional work, um, you know, from doing these ELR 22s. Uh, as far as the channel goes, I mean, I think we've covered about everything we need to cover for tonight. And I'm always open to questions. You can always email me. Uh, but I do have some pretty cool things coming up. I just got a new pistol in that I had ordered. It is the um, Atlas Gunworks, the Artemis. I uh, wanted a pistol that could do both iron sights or red dot. And so you can take it off, put the other plate on. It's good to go. And it's a 2011 style. Also, uh, there's a new scope out by Zeiss. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it. it. has 145 minutes of adjustment. It is sick. Uh, might be getting one of those to review, uh, along with some other things that are going to be pretty cool. But uh, for you guys that are having to run 40 and 50 minutes in your bases, this will kind of kill all of that. You'll be able to do it all in one squash. With the, yeah, it's got a locking turret. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you put uh, put that along along with uh, 50 minutes. Yeah, who knows how far? You don't even need a uh, prism or a Charlie Tatcom or any of that other stuff. So some really still cool stuff coming down the line. Also, to, uh, uh, let's see, a Daniel Defense Mark 18 machine gun, as well as the Geisley Super Duty and then uh, BNT APC 9K machine gun. So some really cool stuff. Anything you want to say before we get out of here? What is what's that? No, I just more or less, you know, I had a fantastic time out there. I would definitely do it again. A uh, huge, huge, huge thank you to you, Ray, for taking the time and taking me out there and teaching me quite a few new things and uh, being patient. And Yeah, we'll do it again. Yeah, no, it was a lot yeah. of fun. I enjoyed Couldn't shooting with you. you so. Yeah, likewise. I mean, it takes two, right? And let's go ahead and get uh, Kenny up here. Anything you'd like to say before we get out of here? Um, like I said, like Matt put it out there, uh, Ray, thanks for getting me out of my, my element and basically going to these matches. Honestly, uh, the only way you're going to get better, like the guys that are top ranking these matches, is something that they, they do it all the time. They work as a team. They go to these matches. You have to get out of your comfort zone and just do the match. It's going to make you a better shooter. It's going to tell you what, what gear you need, what gear doesn't work. And obviously, um, you and your, your partner that you shoot with just get better and better. From day one, the next day to the third day, you just end up becoming a better shooter overall as a team. So definitely get out there and just try it. It's a great, fun way to just enjoy the awesome scenery, by the way, um, and have fun shooting. So, Yeah, it's a great way to meet new people, and you'll find that almost everyone's friendly and they'll share the information. And remember, everybody started off as a beginner, okay? Nobody just immediately shot their first match and they started winning everything. Um, so there is a learning curve with it, but that whole process is just awesome. And the people you meet along the way. So I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. Yeah. If we don't talk to you or uh, hear from you soon, um, stay safe. And we will talk to, you, talk to you again in the near future. Thanks, Rick, for letting us use the studio. Anytime. Thanks, All right, guys, take care. Bye. Have a great evening. Later, folks. See you.